Hey everybody, this is First Ward Storm Team Chief Meteorologist Brian Penovich. It is Friday night, it's about 9.26. We're just sitting here on September 8th and we're still talking about Irma. Today is kind of the big day between when we're going to find out if Irma's going to make this turn. I turn my volume down over there, sorry. Um, let's go right to the satellite picture here to kind of show you what's going on with Irma right now. and get a pretty good view of Irma. You can see it there um, just north of the Cuban coast. It's actually getting really close to the coastline. Um, and the eye's a little bit ragged tonight. Now, Cuba's really, really flat in this area, so there's not a huge chance that this would weaken it a, a ton, but it could have a little bit of effect. Just the land mass alone would allow it to maybe stay a little bit weaker, but there's one big caveat in this, um, and I'm going to show you what that is. Let me show you a different view of the satellite real quickly. Um, there's the radar and satellite together. We're starting to see some rain bands come up through the Florida Straits. The reason that this is kind of a do or kind of die kind of situation as far as strengthening versus weakening is this water temperature here is some of the, the warmest water you're going to see in the entire Atlantic Basin. Um, it's almost 90 degree water down there. So if it isn't overland and it just nudges back offshore here, you're looking at some of the warmest water in the Atlantic and it could strengthen pretty quickly before it makes that approach towards the Keys um, going up towards South Florida. So you're looking at some really warm water in this part of the Caribbean and the Atlantic. Let's look at those steering currents again and you'll hear me talk more about these steering currents uh, coming up. Two pieces of energy. I get a lot of questions the last couple of days about what's pulling this thing north. Well, the high that's been shoving it off to the west is actually not moving much further west. So it's losing that nudge to the west. And if you look carefully, there's two little what we call short waves. Uh, these are little, um, little, little disturbances in the jet stream. And if you heard me talk about these the other day, uh, the long wave pattern in the atmosphere are the jet streams, the troughs and the ridges. Short waves are like essentially that, little short waves that ride along there. And two of these are going to come down, one there, one there. They're going to dive down here, and they're going to create one upper low, and that's going to pull the system back in this direction. But it's got to make that churn, which we haven't seen it make yet, um, which is one of the things we're kind of waiting for. So let me show you the track um, for those who haven't seen the latest update from the Hurricane Center. 8 p.m. advisory winds are still at 155 miles per hour. Borderline Category 5, Category 4. Don't get caught up in those numbers. You're talking one mile per hour. So it's it's essentially the same storm. I, I talked about this this morning. Folks who are watching my, my vlog on my Facebook page, you know, you're debating over getting hit by an 18-wheeler or a bus. It's, it's going to be bad either way. Don't worry about the number that the storm has because uh, the winds are the only thing that defines the category. The, the surge, the rain, and the damage are all pretty much destructive and catastrophic once you get above a three, four, and five. You're all in the same ballpark there, so it doesn't really matter. Um, you see it moving towards the west, clipping the Cuban coast, and then re-strengthening to a five on Sunday. So the Hurricane Center is thinking that this is going to stay over this really warm water here, re-strengthen to 160 miles per hour, and make that right churn and move into South Florida. And this is pretty much if this continues at this pace and it's 160 miles an hour, this will be one of the worst storms to ever hit South Florida. This will surpass Andrew, Charlie, Wilma, all those. Just because of the amount of people that live here now and live here, it's wind, it's surge, it's everything. All impacts. So um, in some locations, this will be some of the worst damage we've seen in a, one of the highest populated areas from a, from a hurricane. Then it moves straight up Florida's peninsula through Fort Myers, um, Melbourne, Sarasota, Tampa Bay, Orlando, Daytona, pretty much the entire state is going to be impacted. Even up there towards Jacksonville, you're thinking, okay, this thing's inland. But remember, the circulation around hurricanes is counterclockwise. So what's going on here this whole time? Water is pushing towards the coast. It can't keep going. It banks up against the east coast of Florida, and we get a huge storm surge up the entire east coast of Florida. And then you move up towards... <laughs> excuse me, southern Georgia. It starts to weaken, but even up here, we're getting pretty good storm surge moving into Brunswick, Jacksonville, um, Savannah, Hilton Head, Edisto Beach, Kiwa, all the way to Charleston. Just the shape, this kind of crescent shape here, 
the water just sits there. It's just nowhere for it to go. And then it takes its turn back to the west. And the reason it takes that turn back to the west is those two little disturbances I talked about, which are called short waves. And that's actually going to pull it back to the to the west. And to kind of show you how that works, this is the 500 millibar chart. It's at the you know it's up there around 15,000 feet in the atmosphere. That's where these short waves develop. And you can see the main steering currents. Here's our player. There's our high, which is rotating clockwise, counterclockwise spin associated there with the hurricane, counterclockwise spin associated with the upper low, which essentially is that what, what that's going to be. And so the high kind of stops pushing it to the west, and you see it just sitting out there, and it's really not coming any farther west. So what happens? This thing, think of this as like a drain because it's spinning counterclockwise, wants to grab it and pull it back into itself. So you'll see that actually happen on the model. Watch it grab it and then pull it back towards the west. So that's why the storm is expected to move north because this thing's like a giant magnet um, for low pressure. Um, hurricanes like to go to the weakest spot. They take the path of least resistance. They don't want to go into high pressure. They go around high pressure. So that's why they went around the high. Well, if this is a weakness in the atmosphere, this is where it wants to go. So it's going to be steered towards that weakness and it's going to be absorbed by that and become an upper low and meander across the mid-south and then push off to the north and east. Now, the concern in all this is obviously for South Florida, it's twofold. The first big impact obviously is going to be wind, but storm surge is going to be a huge issue. Now, when the waves are crashing and the wind is pushing ashore, uh, the waves continue to push water, it banks up, high tide comes in, but it can't go back out. So over time, this water starts to build up, and that surge continues to build um, over time as each high tide, progressive high tide, gets higher and higher and higher. And so what happens is the water comes up three feet. In some cases, it's going to come up close to six feet. And in South Florida, I think it's going to be between 6 and 12 feet in some spots. The average, it looks like, is going to be around 9 feet above ground level. So if ground level is this green line, um, it's going to be up here in this range somewhere. Um, so anywhere in Miami-Dade and all the way over towards, uh, the tan uh, over towards Naples and Fort Myers, the Everglades, Lake Okeechobee, all these bodies of waters, the canals, all these things that make Florida so great become a huge liability um, in this issue, in, in, in this type of storm becomes a big issue. So the storm surge potential, let's really quickly look at that. I'll show you down in South Florida. You can see based on the current track, huge storm surge here in some cases approaching 12 to 14, maybe 15 feet, all the way up towards Fort Myers. Um, you see the Miami area, especially the south side of Miami, southern Dade County. Boy, they got nowhere, nowhere in the Keys is going to be safe. Hopefully every single person that is able to get out of the Florida Keys got out. Then Lake Okeechobee, huge storm surge. People don't realize you get huge surge on Lake Okeechobee. Um, and then the Fort Myers, Bonita Springs, Naples area, um, very close to where Charlie and Wilma came in down here. I was actually down here for Wilma. Um, area just seems, you know, it had really tough go there for two years in a row. And then you go further north going up towards Tampa Bay. Now what's interesting about the Tampa Bay and um, Sarasota and uh, St. Petersburg area is if the storm stays just inland here, um, the flow around it would actually push water from one side of Tampa Bay to the other side. So down towards Sarasota and, and St. Pete, you would have some huge um, possible surge issues. On the East Coast, you can see anywhere from three to five feet of surge. And then you get up towards Jacksonville. And notice, even though the storm is weaker up here, notice how the numbers for the surge start to go back up. So areas uh, north of Jacksonville, which is really, really... Um, susceptible to storm surge and you can see the the surge here so you're thinking about well, the storms west it's weak brad it's not a big deal look at this surge in here um maybe five to six and seven feet now this is the maximum potential so this is kind of the worst case scenario with this setup right now it could be lower but if this occurs at high tide with waves and even up towards wilmington you could get a one or two foot storm surge so just to kind of illustrate the type of impacts this is going to bring and for that reason you can see the hurricane warnings all of South Florida and hurricane watches up through central Florida. And the reason that we have these uh, watches and warnings only in place up to here, it's a timing. 
Um, this is where we expect hurricane conditions to occur within 36 to 48 hours. So these watches and warnings are issued based on time from arrival of the conditions. So we expect these conditions further north. It's just 72 hours out from it hitting up in that area. So that's why we don't have um, that area right now under any kind of watch or advisory or anything like that um, for that reason. Now I wanted to see if I can get this to work. Uh, another graphic is a really cool tool and I'm going to put this on my page and my Facebook page if you get a chance to check it out. Um, this is a really cool tool that LSU and UNC system has done here in the Carolinas. This is the Coastal Emergency Risk Assessment page. They run a model showing uh, water inundation as well and you could see let me move my my head here if I can grab my head out of the way. Let me see if I can grab it. I've got to grab it. I'm going to move myself up to the upper corner here so you can see the key in the bottom of the screen and I'm going to move it down so you can see it. But you can also see this shows the storm surge in South Florida as well. Extensive storm surge there. Let's go in closer because you can zoom in on this map um, and you can see some parts of Miami and, and we'll give it a second to update here. Hopefully it'll the resolution will, will change a little bit, but you can see there, there will be some storm surge in Miami. You can see it filling in. Must have super slow internet, or this page is being overwhelmed right now with people looking at the same thing we are. Probably that's the case, but um, I will put this link on there. Hopefully, <laughs> excuse me, hopefully it'll work a little bit better, but it's really slow loading. Just like the Hurricane Center page, seems like everything's being inundated with so many people trying to get information that it's overwhelming it, but you get a pretty good idea um, of, of actual neighborhoods and stuff that could be be hit by this higher water in this area. Come on, fill in. It's slowly filling in here. But this will give you a really good indication. Again, and here's the, uh, the Florida Everglades. So you can see some of the sur surge over here is pretty impressive. And you can look up and down the coast. So I'll put that on my page. You guys can check it out. Um, I think it's a really useful resource to kind of use um, to go look at some of this stuff. Um, as far as the Carolinas, so as this thing gets closer up to the Carolinas, I'm going to speak to the, uh, my Carolina peeps here. A couple things are interesting. Everyone saw the track today and thinks we're going to get totally missed, but it's not necessarily the case because is the is this front, I don't know why I did that, um, the hurricane merges with this front, a couple things happen. The rain is going to start spreading out along this front and this high to the north the combination of that high being so strong and the strong low pressure is going to kind of channel this um, air through here. So the east and northeast winds could be particularly strong as this comes up to the north um, and starts spreading that moisture. And the other thing is you worry about tornadoes in this area right in here south of this boundary. So the, the, the threat for tornadoes is, is an issue we're going to have to watch carefully depending on how much moisture and warming we can get going on. Um, across our area. So I made this graphic last couple days. I'm going to continue to update this. Uh, I'll erase my line there. The catastrophic to extreme wind damage in central and southern Florida and then the high risk up in here for um, damaging winds. And you got to understand as you get inland you don't need as high a wind threshold to cause damage because the trees are different. There's more trees. They're not used to the winds on the coast um, and you're going to get water in the form of rain falling on a lot of these areas which is going to end up loosening the soil and especially in the mountains. I think the mountains in here could see some really high winds. Maybe the peaks could gust to 75 in some locations as these really strong winds come in but you can see kind of the setup there for <clears throat> the, the wind impacts. Now rain impacts it's going to be heavy rain but you're not looking at anything like Harvey or Houston set up here. You're looking at probably um, four to seven inches in the red. The kind of orange would probably be in that three to five inch range and then maybe one to three in the yellow. So overall I'm not you know hugely worried about the rainfall um, with this system. So kind of let me show you the bottom lines here for local impacts and this includes the Western Carolinas and all my, my followers on Facebook and Twitter um, all up and down the coast. This is going to be oriented towards my Charlotte and Western Carolinas people. So winds in the Charlotte area 30 to 40 miles per hour, gust up to 50, tree limbs and trees coming down and I think that's mainly going to happen because over time that wind is going to be sustained at 30 to 40. It's not just a quick passing shower and it's done. It could be 6 to 12 hours of those winds with rain falling and eventually the trees 
we and this is what I envision happening. I envision nothing really going on Monday, and then all of a sudden Monday night into Tuesday morning, we're going to start seeing trees fall down as the soil finally loosens up and the trees just give in to that persistent wind. Heavy rains, two to five inches, localized flooding, and yes, isolated tornadoes, mainly south and east, wherever the warmer air can get into the Carolinas. I think that's really the area um, that we'll have to watch. Now, as far as winds, this is our modeled winds, by the way, just to show you the highest wind gust possible from the European model. Um, you can see, I'll pause it right there, 9 o'clock on Monday night. Look at some of these gusts. I mean, that's enough to bring down trees, guys. Um, even though the center could be way over here, look how far out the winds extend to the east. Almost four to 600 miles off to the east, we're going to have damaging winds. Um, and you can see that big core moving into the mountains. Remember, the center is going to be over this way somewhere. But off to the right side, that northeast and eastern quadrant, that's where you're going to get the highest winds um, as they move in. And as it merges with that upper low, the winds will calm down a little bit. But even on Tuesday afternoon, we could have gusts between 25 and 30. And even going into Wednesday, because the upper low, remember, it merges with that low, which is then going to start moving like this. The winds are going to stay up. It's going to be pretty breezy. So we could have trees coming down on Wednesday because the ground's saturated and they've been blown around one direction, blown the other. And you can see it probably takes until Thursday until the winds really start to calm down for the most part. So, you know, that's that's kind of the thing we're thinking about for the Carolinas, even though it's not it's not a huge win. It's not Hugo. I've said that like a bazillion times. And for whatever reason, people are still set on this being Hugo. It is not going to be Hugo. Everybody in, in the Carolinas, repeat after me, this is not going to be Hugo. This is going to be Irma. <laughs> it's going to be a far different storm. Um, and it doesn't mean that we're not going to see some damage. It's just not going to be to the levels of a Hurricane Hugo. So that's a look at the storm tonight. We better start seeing that churn. Um, coming up here in the next 12 hours, or we're going to have this thing go farther west. I had a lot of questions today about, is this, could this go back to the east? That's not happening. I don't see any turn to the east anytime soon. If anything, it's going to go further west. So if you're asking about, could it come back to the east more, that's, that's a big negative. Uh, <laughs> I don't think it's going to come back to the east at all. It would have to go back to the west. So that's what I'm thinking right now. It's 9.43. Thanks for watching tonight. I know it's a Friday night. A lot of folks are at high school football games. Um, you still got all weekend to prepare in the Carolinas in South Florida. For all friends, family, people watching down there, get out if you can. You still have time. Don't mess with this one. This is not the type of storm where you say, you know what? I've been here for XYZ storm and it never happened. Don't, don't be that person, okay? Don't be that person. If you're going to stay, I would I highly recommend against it. Make sure you're ready to be without water, food, power, anyone to help you for days, maybe a week or longer. Um, the one thing about staying, I had a lot of people when I worked in New Orleans before Katrina, um, in Florida when I was down in Wilma, everyone says, I'm staying. And I always say, you know, if you're careful and you're in a good spot, you might survive. That's step one. Problem is, if you do survive, which I think a lot of people will if they're if they're in a shelter, the bad part about it staying is what happens after. You're stuck on a roof. You're stuck in a building torn up. You're stuck with no air conditioning, no running water, no bathroom, no food, no gas, no money. Those are the things people don't think about. They think, I'll be fine. It's the aftermath that you don't want to be around for. Um, so surviving the storm is just half the battle in these situations. The aftermath is almost worse sometimes because you're there with nothing for days and days and days. And so some cases leaving is just a matter of, you know, I want, I don't want to be stuck in this miserable settings, um, after a storm moves through. So there's a look at the storm right now. Hurricane hunters are out there right now. I'll be checking the latest on what they're finding. If the storm is strengthening to see if it's going to be back to a category five, We'll wait and see if that happens, and make sure you tune in at 11 o'clock. I'll have the latest forecast track, and make sure you follow me on Facebook. I will do a vlog tomorrow. Uh, my plan is to do one in the mornings around the 11 a.m. advisory. That's what I've been doing. I'll be working tomorrow night at 6, and then I'll be working all day Sunday, Monday, and Tuesday as we get through this storm together. That's what it's all about. So just prepare. Don't freak out. Um, in the Carolinas, we'll be ready for this thing regardless of what heads our way. Have a great Friday night, everybody, and I'll see you tonight at 11.